Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. so this week at the General Richie Flow Seminar, we have Carlos Sabasi from UNED, Madrid and Hamburg University, who is going to speak about the Terotic Richie Flow and its three dimensional solitor. Thanks. So thanks for having me here. It's a great pleasure to talk about this work, which uh, is very preliminary. So my objective here is just to present the basic setup of the problem. Actually, please interrupt me at any uh, point because um, actually I will be in a sense asking you questions about some, some of the issues that I've been finding. And the goal is to introduce a curvature flow, which is we are calling uh, temporarily the heterotic Ritchie flow, which is the two loop renormalization group flow of the heterotic string common sec. I will explain what this means in a moment. And then <clears throat> as a first attempt to understand this flow, we're gonna uh, study some of its solitonic solutions. So some of its solid. This heterotic Ritchie flow is gonna have a, a new ingredient, which is going to be very familiar to you because it's, uh, this new ingredient is a higher curvature term, which is familiar from the generalized geometry of um, uh, transitive current algebras or string current algebras, as I will uh, mention later. So this um, higher curvature term, we can think of it as being added to the standard generalized Ritchie flow that, uh, well, uh, you all know very well. Um, and uh, aside from reducing to the generalized Ritchie flow, when this parameter kappa is equal to zero, this heterotic uh, Ritchie flow depends on a, a real parameter that controls this uh, higher order correction. Another uh, or an interesting point about this uh, flow is that when h is equals to zero, so this is a curvature flow for a metric couple to a three form. So when this h is equal to zero, we uh, obtain a constrained form of the RG2 flow. So the renormalization group flow of uh, pure general relativity at uh, second order. Okay, so the, this is the uh, most uh, important novel feature of this flow. And let me just clarify a bit the origin of this flow. So the, the, sorry, Carlos, the two in RG2 flow stands for like a second order correction, like coming from yes. quadratic it's terms right. in the curvature or something. Like at, uh, at two loops okay. in the computation of these beta functionals. So. Okay. The RG2 flow is the, uh, or the RG flow, or the, yeah, the RG2 flow is the flow of this, is the flow obtained as a randomization group flow of this action when both B and uh, phi are absent. So you just have a, a pure nonlinear sigma model for maps from a Riemann surface to some dark matter. More generally, what we can do is to consider bosonic string theory. And for that, we can fix a compact and oriented real two dimensional manifold and some target space, which we will call M. And we consider this action functional that I wrote here. I will be brief because I know you know these things uh, uh, very well. And this is an action functional that depends on the choice of a background triple, this G, B, and phi, where G is a Riemannian metric on M B is a two form and phi is a function, okay? These are defined on M, they are not dynamical variables. They are just a fixed triple that is required to specify such action. The configuration space of this action is the space of metrics on X and the space of maps from, maps from X uh, to M. So this is the basic uh, action functional defining bosonic string theory at the classical level and it admits a large group of automorphisms. And among these, um, some uh, automorphisms stand by it, their importance. And these are the vile transformations of the method, namely conformal rescalings of the method. So uh, as I was saying, the triple GB phi that determines the action functional is not dynamical. These are just a, a choice that one makes in order to determine such a action. 
And classically, every such choice of metric B field and phi and dilaton, let's call it, uh, gives rise to a well-defined theory at the classical level in the sense that the equations of motion that one can derive through a variational principle are perfectly well-defined. However, when one tries to quantize this, well, one needs to, physicists, they, um, involve, they use a regularization procedure that makes all these uh, couplings be dependent in some uh, parameter lambda, which is related to the uh, renormalization scale that has been fixed. And when you do that, then the action is no longer invariant under veil conformal transformation. And this is not allowed physically for uh, various reasons that uh, I'm not qualified to discuss. So, so uh, how is the what is the relation between this lambda and alpha prime, or is it the same? Um, it's not the same because alpha prime is the parameter in which you do the loop expansion. And this ultraviolet cutoff is the um, parameter with respect to you, you take the derivatives of the flow. So we will see that now explicitly. OK, OK. okay. okay but thanks. everything that I say about this precise um, problem Take it with a pinch of salt because I'm far from an expert in this. I try to learn, but uh, it's not. Uh... So at the end of the day, you end up with some background fields, G, B, and phi, which are not dynamical, are interpreted as the coupling constants of your theory, which are now promoted from constants to fields. And they depend on a parameter T, which is essentially the logarithm of the renormalization scale. And they are bound to, satis to satisfy this system of uh, differential equations, where on the right hand side, one has what is called the beta functionals. Once you compute the beta functionals, then you know how your, by solving these equations, how your couplings, in this case, coupling uh, tensors or coupling functions, depend on the um, renormalization scale. And while invariance, at the quantum level is apparently controlled by setting the right-hand side equals to zero modulo time-dependent diffeomorphisms. Okay, so it's not; it doesn't have to be zero on the uh, on the nodes. So computing the beta functionals is something that apparently is very difficult, and physicists do it perturbatively in the constant kappa. I'm calling it kappa, but this is essentially the spring slow parameter or one over the spring slow parameter. So this is the, I guess, is the is actually the string slope parameter. So you see now this is the renormalization scale or the log of the renormalization scale, and then you have this this um, constant in which in terms of which you take the this uh, expansion. So it's not considered as a running coupling constant of your theory, but I don't know the reasons why. So that I don't know. So, well, this is a, a, at first order, this is the standard result that you know very well, written in terms of G and uh, B. And this is the result for the uh, dilator. Okay, so here we have the renormalization group flow for both three um, objects appearing as coupling functions in our uh, theory, in our uh, action function. So we define for, for um, we have defined for simplicity these, these objects here. Okay. So, um, well, equivalently, well, not equivalently, but implied by the previous equations, we can consider this evolution equation for, for H. Carlos, in the previous equation, what is delta, delta phi T? So in the evolution of the dilaton, what is uh, yeah, the delta T? This, this you mean, right? Yeah. You can see my mouse, right? Yeah, yes. Okay, so this is the adjoint of the exterior derivative. Ah, okay, so you're taking the dilaton as a one form. Well, yes, it's simply two. Okay, right? no, it is, okay, okay. But, and then, so what happens with the scalar curvature? Why is not there in the evolution for the dilaton? That's a good question. And I, I was actually hoping to, come back to this question in a moment, but it, it is not there. If you just check the, the beta functionals 
and not the anomaly vial coefficients, then they don't appear there. It doesn't appear there. Actually, so the beta functional is, is literally what you wrote. It's a constant plus kappa divided exactly. by two minus Laplacian plus the norm of h squared. The, the right sign Laplacian. In order for this to be a heat uh, equation. Yeah, this may be interesting for Jeff. Because, because I, I, always, I always thought that the beta function for the dilaton was covering also this is scalar curvature, but you're saying that it's not. I mean, at, at least this is how it's written in the Kalan, Kalan, Friedan. Yes, because I think in that reference, they write the anomaly vial coefficients, right? Not the beta functionals. The distinction it escapes me, to be honest. But what I know is that the renormalization group flow is written in terms of this, of the strict beta functionals. And if I'm not mistaken, hopefully I'm not, I, I checked this, I mean, I, I noticed this, and actually I wanted to discuss this with you. So this is very, uh, so your question comes right to the point. Um, this is what I get. And I, in a moment, I will give you references in, in any case. So okay. we, we can check in more detail, actually. So, um, well, in either case, the evolution equation for this uh, dilaton decouples can be considered separately. And then um, by re after rescaling by kappa, we obtain this form of the generalized Ricci flow in terms of HT, which again, uh, you know very well. So now, well, the generalized, generalized Ricci flow has been studied intensively in the literature. You can check your own book if you want, or ARPAN, you can check their book. And um, it has many potential applications in mathematics, including, if I'm not mistaken, after the reviews I read, the problem of classifying complex uh, surfaces in two complex dimensions. So anyway, this comes out of studying this renormalization group flow at first order in this parameter kappa, whatever it means, it's related to the uh, string slope parameter. So a natural question is what happens if we consider higher order corrections in kappa? Now there is a problem in a sense. If we want to consider higher order corrections in kappa, we need to choose which string theory we use to compute such corrections. The reason why this didn't happen at first order is that what we were considering for the generalized Ricci flow is the common sector of all the string theories. So no matter which string theory you use, you get that result. Now, this is a bit different because we want to go uh, beyond this uh, first order and we have to uh, choose a particular string theory. When I say choose a particular string theory where to compute these uh, corrections, of course, I don't mean I will compute the corrections myself. That's a very hard problem, even harder than computing it at first order. So we have to check the literature, dive right into these uh, papers written by physicists in the 80s about uh, these conformal field theory calculations and extract the result and interpret it geometrically. Okay, so this is what I, what we have done. And what we have done is to consider the bosonic string as the Neves-Schwarz, Neves-Schwarz truncation of heterotic string theory. Okay, because it is a common, it is part of heterotic string theory, this Neves-Schwarz, Neves-Schwarz uh, uh, sector. And, it, as I said, checking the literature and, and uh, reviewing the bibliography, we found that the um, renormalization group flow is in this case given up to second order in kappa by this formula. Okay, so this is exactly as the one that we had for uh, the generalized Ricci flow for the case of HT. This is written in terms of HT intentionally instead of B because the notion of B is not clear at this point for in this context. I will mention this again in a moment. And the evolution for the metric is modified by this term, which is essentially a contraction in three indices of the curvature of a metric connection with a torsion exactly H. So skew-symmetric torsion, torsion given by H. So this is the modification we get here. I will show you the, this term explicitly in a moment, spelled out. This is not modified. 
And now this equation here is modified by the norm of this curvature, okay? And uh, the condition that happened in the general Ricci flow that uh, requires HT to be closed is modified here uh, into this uh, Bianchi identity, which needs to satis be satisfied at every T. And again, this evolution equation for the dilaton decouples. So it can be considered separately again. Um, so proceeding exactly as um, people uh, or you have done in the um, general Ricci flow case, we can forget about higher order corrections, higher order in, in kappa, and rescale uh, once um, the time with kappa, and then we define what we are calling now the heterotic Ricci flow, which is just a correction to the generalized Ricci flow, depending on this uh, constant kappa, as prescribed by heterotic spin field. Nothing is only that. So here we are discarding this dilaton equation, but uh, in a sense, since we are studying this generalized, uh, sorry, this renormalization group flow, it is important to, to see what happens with it. So given a solution of the, uh, this heterotic Ricci flow, we would like to guarantee that there exists a um, family of dilatons such that the evolution equation for the dilaton is also satisfied. Okay, so this is what I uh, suggest here. Um, that uh, in order to have a full solution, we need to be able to complete such uh, heterotic Ricci flow. So, um, I will come back to there is, yes. I, I'm I'm not sure about the your sign for the Laplacian, but there is always this issue that the 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 dilaton the evolution equation for the dilaton goes backwards in time. So in general, it's not that in a moment uh, because it's something that I wanted to clarify. So it's nice that we are we can do it uh, now. Perhaps this is just to spell out the various inner products here. So as I as I mentioned, this this object here. Is nothing but a, a three index contraction of the curvature of whatever connection you put here. And we are using this metric connection with skew-symmetric torsion given by H. And this has a relatively complicated expression in terms of the Riemann tensor of G and the extra terms, which you know uh, well. And uh, yeah. So here, uh, is the slide about the point that Mario was making. So actually with the uh, type of signs we get for this evolution of the dilaton equation, since this is a, a well-posed heat equation for a given background data, GT, HT, then for every heterotic Ricci flow, we can find a um, solution of the dilaton evolution equation. And I compare this to uh, what happens in, in to what you explain in your book, and also to this uh, paper by Olinik, Suneta, and Volga, where they do this uh, gradient flow. And they have a footnote where they say that um, in this, there is at some point in the procedure a function that satisfies a backwards heat equation but that's not the dilaton and that's not the rg uh, so the equation prescribed by the renormalization group flow for the dilaton this is the footnote nine in page nine which i think it it at least points out in the direction that this might be uh, all consistent with what they do so um yeah uh, as far as I uh, obtain checking the literature, and I checked this in several places. Actually, in their paper, this equation is also written explicitly, and the sign here of the Laplacian is the same as uh, I have written here, if I interpreted everything correctly. So, within this setup, then every um, heterotic Ricci flow or generalized Ricci flow for that matter can be completed into a full solution of the randomization group flow. Yeah, I just want to say it's it's a 
it's a sort of somewhat mysterious feature of the Ricci flow story that the the dilaton okay. flow suggested by this RG flow picture is forward in time, but then all of these Perlman uh, functionals and stuff involve coupling to a backwards heat equation, and I guess you say it's sort of not the dilaton. Well, it's I mean it's not this dilaton, but it certainly plays a a, a very similar role, I guess. Yes, indeed. Uh, in, well, in the in the functionals and things like that. So yeah, it's a somewhat mysterious thing. Okay, so so yeah. everything makes sense then. So yeah, um, I, it, that they say is not strictly speaking the dilaton, but indeed it plays the role of the dilaton essentially as if it was exactly the dilaton except for that uh, issue. So yeah, if it is mysterious for you, then uh, I'm I'm happy <laughs> in a sense. So, um, yeah, so then um, by the previous result, we don't need to be concerned about the Dilaton equation because as soon as we have a deteriorated Ricci flow, we know that we can complete it. It is, however, important to define the solitons of the flow because it is not the same to include this evolution equation, when, evolution equation when, you have to go, when you want to compute the solitons of the, of the flow or not include it because that if you include it, then you have an extra equation for your solitons. So then there, there is a difference, but otherwise uh, it's irrelevant for, for our purposes. And what I wanted to mention now is that this formulation, it has been written, has been written in terms of H and an evolution equation for H. However, the proper gauge theoretic formulation of this flow needs to be done in terms of the B field. And for this, one is to uh, use a correct mathematical description of the B field. It is thought that this can be done on a string structure, in this case defined on the frame bundle, or it can be also done through the use of transitive current algebras. So on transiting current algebras of a string type, as introduced by, by Mario, you can consider a generalized Ricci flow for a family of uh, generalized metrics in that uh, a string uh, current algebra, and within that generalized metric, it is possible to describe what I'm calling here the B field. However, it is not a priori completely obvious that the flow that I am introducing here can be descri described as a um, generalized Ricci flow on a string current algebra. I think it should be, and I think there should be a um, condition on the space of generalized metrics, a natural condition that guarantees that the associated um, evolution problem as a generalized Ricci flow coincides with this one, but it's not uh, certain a priori. The issue is that in the, if I understood correctly, in the generalized Ricci flow on a, a string current algebra, there is a term exactly of this type, so this is fine. The only issue is that in its full generality, this is a um, term for its own gauge connection on a principal bundle, which is evolving independently. Here, such connection uh, is fixed to be precisely this metric connection we talk. So that's the condition one needs to recover. I hope it can be done, but uh, this is something that I'm planning to uh, come back in the future. So for example, when, when M is two dimensional, then HT is uh, automatically zero. And then we get on the nose, the RG2 flow. This is the RG2 flow in two dimensions, and it has been studied. It, it reduces to this type of equation. And there are examples in this, in this reference. When more generally in higher dimensions, when HT is equals to zero, then we also recover this equation, but the Bianchi identity imposes this type of constraint, which might be, or might look a bit artificial at this moment, but in a moment you will see that um, it can be solved, at least at the level of solitons. So I wonder if, uh, because this, this flow is notably difficult, I, I wonder if solutions that satisfy this constraint with h equals zero, sorry, here is, this should be uh, absent, uh, have a somewhat, uh, are somewhat better behaved, better behaved. So um, 
that's something that I would like to uh, study in the future as well. So I, I, as I'm saying, this is very preliminary. So please uh, interrupt me if you have any complaints or anything. So now, when computing the solidons of this system, uh, it, will be, it is necessary to, to have a proper formulation of the B field in this case, and a formulation in terms of the B field in order, for, in order to know how the automorphisms properly act. Since we don't have that, we are going to just restrict to three dimensions, which, in which this flow is um, highly non-trivial, non because in this case, we, also, we, we have DHT equals zero, and therefore, uh, we can interpret easily the soliton equation because HT we can write as H0 plus DBT. So computing the uh, subsimilar solutions just with respect to the femorphisms depending on time, we get these uh, solitonic type of equations, which are of the standard type, except that we have this extra higher order term here. Okay. So uh, the important thing for me and for my purposes is that these equations provide a generalization of the supergravity equations. These are a generalization because first, this vector field B is too general and uh, we are missing the Dilaton equation as well. So these are not the supergravity equations on the nose, but the supergravity equations uh, are going to give us a natural subfamily of solitons of this heterotic Ricci flow. So for this, uh, in order to um, study the solitons, then I will restrict to, to study this, the solutions of the supergravity. Can you, can you say again what is the notation nabla GH is torsion H or minus H? What is here? Uh, well, here is minus H. Okay. That's conventional. Indeed. So uh, instead of uh, studying this system of uh, couple equations, which is very general, I'm going to restrict to the subclass of solutions, which also satisfy the supergravity equations in the sense that I will describe now. So, well, heterotic supergravity is a supersymmetrization of einstein gamil system uh, with this sign that, by the way, this is not accidental. And it's uh, defined on a principal bundle with some structure group uh, G and equipped with some definite inner product. And again, the uh, positive constant kappa. So heterotic supergravity is completely determined once you fix such data. So a manifold uh, M, a principal bundle over it, some inner product on the joint and a constant. And it's defined through the following very complicated system of partial differential equations, which involve as variables, a Riemannian metric G, a closed one form phi, a three form H, and a, a gauge connection A, so a connection on this principal bundle P. This is a system equation that is prescribed by supersymmetry, is unique, and it has been uh, extensively studied in the literature, literature especially, especially through its uh, supersymmetric solutions. So the Bianchi identity here is a modification of the type of equation that we have found before by uh, the inclusion of a term that depends on the curvature of this uh, gauge bundle, this principal bundle. So as a class of this, um, of the solutions of this system are given by uh, the supersymmetric solutions. And these supersymmetric solutions are triples G phi H A that satisfy some extra spinorial equation. So these spinorial equations are spelled out here. So a tuple satisfying the solutions that, uh, satisfying the equations that I just wrote is supersymmetric if there exists a spinor such that these equations are satisfied. Here, this is the lift to the spinor bundle of the metric connection compatible with G with torsion minus H, so H, applied to the spinor. This is just Clifford multiplication of forms. And this is again Clifford multiplication of forms. And by a theorem of um, Ivanov, a tuple satisfying the Killing Spinner equation and the Bianchi identity is a solution if and only if this uh, uh, connection with torsion here is, is an instant. Okay, so these uh, Spinner equations are obtained um, 
by um, inspection of the supersymmetry transformations on a bosonic pattern. And by the way, the, uh, these heterotic killing spinor equations are equivalent to the Hall Strominger system. The only thing is that usually in the literature, the system is uh, presented in an equivalent, more palatable way in terms of uh, polystable, polystable holomorphic vector bundles over a certain class of complex uh, manifolds. So in four dimensions, all supersymmetric solutions of this uh, system are known. They consist on, regarding the base space, they consist of either flux com a flat complex story, K3 surfaces, or quaternionic complex Hof surfaces. And the question that links the, uh, this supersymmetry theory with the um, description of uh, solitons, soliton solutions to the previous uh, flow is the question about the uh, existence of and construction of non supersymmetric solutions. Because in this context, general solutions, general solitons of the theoretical Ricci flow are going, to interpret, are going to be interpreted as non supersymmetric solutions. So, in order to make contact with as I said, the solitonic equations of the theoretic Ricci flow, we assume this P to be trivial, this gauge bundle, we forget about it. And then this bosonic heterotic supergravity reduces to this system of partial differential equations, now um, particularized to dimension four, which is the dimension that I will consider in the following. So here we are, I'm just spelling this H contracted with H in terms of the dual of H, which is a one form. So in this dimension is simply more convenient for us to um, consider the uh, this formulation in terms of alpha. So in the limit kappa going to zero, we recover the equations of a generalized Ricci soliton, but with the extra equation of the dilaton, which is usually not considered. So in this sense, uh, these heterotic solitons uh, provide an extension of a particular class of generalized Ricci solid, which are the ones that satisfy also this, this dilaton equation. And the correction is again encoded in this term here, this term here, and this modification of the dilaton equation. So just to give you a, a simple class of heterotic solids, which we can just take as for fun, alpha equals to this Barfi. So here we have two one forms, alpha and Barfi. Barfi is essentially the exterior derivative of the dilaton, but I'm just not considering it to be exact, just to have a bit more generality. And then uh, if we do that, then the heterotic soliton system reduces, simplifies a, a lot and uh, leads to this equation for the Ricci tensor of G using this identity. So in, in this case, everything simplifies uh, quite a lot. And then it can be seen that every solution is covered universally by R times S3 with the standard product method. Okay. So for this type of ansatz in which alpha is equals to Murphy, equals Murphy, then every solution of these equations is covered universally by R times S3 with the uh, product metric or some round metric of given radius. And these type of manifolds are actually studied by themselves by Godushon in a reference which is called, uh, in, the title, in the title has the, the term manifolds of type S1 times S3. And these are precisely these, these manifolds that we find here. And this um, quaternionic complex Hopf surfaces that I uh, mentioned as particular classes of supersymmetric solutions are in turn particular classes of R times S3, uh, sorry, of uh, manifolds of type S1 times S3. So these yes, are- as a, as a comment, I'm not sure if you, I guess a, a priori you're not assuming any compatibility with any complex structure, right? You are just taking the equations. Exactly. I'm just uh, yes, to mention that, uh, that there is also the, this paper by Jeff classifying solitons for the pluricloss flow. 
and he obtains the same result. But I think, Jeff, you, you assume compatibility with the compressor structure or it's not necessarily? Uh, uh, yeah, no, we have to assume some kind of, uh, oh. I mean, yeah, there has to be Hermitian for sure. Yeah. Yeah, the thing is that I think the, the, the difference is that the solution, that the equations that you consider, Jeffrey or Mario, are more uh, general in the sense, not of this higher order curvature correction, let's forget about that, but in the sense of the Dilaton equation. This is crucial. Um, for the type of restricted results that I'm mentioning. In your yeah, case, like, uh, we cannot expect uh, like, uh, yeah, you don't you don't expect the splitting in general. Like, uh, like Hessian phi will not vanish. For, and for if this, I'm not mistaken, for the you, solid you don't even, we have. Yeah, sorry. Don't yeah, worry. no, I was just saying. Oh, go ahead, please. Yeah. No, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> um, no, what I was going to say is that. Uh, first of all, one difference is that you consider this um, phi to be the gradi gradient of a function, right? Yes. Yeah. And uh, you cannot do that here. If you do that here, then there are no non-trivial solutions. And on the other hand, even if you consider, in a sense, a particular case of this construction by taking this to be a gradient, you don't consider this equation. So it's in that sense more general. Actually, what you are doing is always solving this equation plus a constant here. Right, that's right, yeah. Exactly. Right, because even if you don't consider it, the exterior derivative of this equation is always automatically satisfied. So, but this constant is crucial then. It's, it's yeah, yeah. freedom that uh, manifests itself quite a lot. So it's a subtle uh, relation. So in this case, actually, this cannot be a gradient because we have a parallel. Uh, we obtain that this must be parallel. And of course, we are assuming that we are on a compact manifold. Um, yeah, otherwise, this is not uh, true in general. So in any case, all these solutions are locally isomorphic to a supersymmetric solution because they are all. Uh, they have the same universal cover and as the um, complex quaternionic complex of surfaces that I mentioned before as a supersymmetric solution. So then these ansatz will not do. It's not good enough to, con to obtain proper non-supersymmetric solutions which are not uh, locally isomorphic to a supersymmetric solution. So in order to do, to now obtain a more general class of solutions, in four dimensions, which is going to be related with a class of three-dimensional solutions of the uh, um, solitonic system that I mentioned before, related to the heterotopic flow, I'm going to make an assumption, important. I'm going to take the dilaton equals a zero or a constant, let's say. So in this case, in, in, the, in your conventions, it will be to take the dilaton constant, this gradient, uh, function equals zero. And then I remain only with the metric and the dual of the H form. This simplifies the system a lot, but it's a, a still not simple enough. So we are going to simplify it further by assuming that essentially the torsion is also parallel. Okay. So now we are, we are, we are um, imposing natural conditions, but if the system doesn't make sense, then we will not find any solution, which is in a, a priori what we uh, were afraid to find, right? Because it may not be possible to find uh, solutions with such a strong conditions. If we assume that this is parallel, then we start getting this type of constraints, which are similar to the constraint that I mentioned before, when you take H, H equals to zero in the heterotic Ricci flow, and you obtain the RG2 flow with, with a constraint. So in four dimensions, this is the type of constraint that you get. And as I will show uh, now, you can solve all these equations uh, very naturally, very naturally. So after all this business, this is the system that I'm going to solve with the assumption that the dilaton is zero, alpha uh, is non-zero, and parallel. So in particular, these solutions cannot be supersymmetric because if they were supersymmetric, then alpha must be equal to uh, phi. 
So we don't we know already that they are not super symmetric. So the first thing that we do is to expand this uh, uh, curvature tensor into the Riemann curvature uh, tensor of G. And Sorry, can, can you say again what is alpha? Alpha is? Is the dual of H. I think uh, Mario disappeared, but probably he had a problem with the connection. Anyway, alpha is the dual of H and um, so we are going to solve these equations here. And the first thing we need to uh, take under control is this higher order term here, because then uh, it appears also here and here in terms of its trace. So we spell this, and well, this is a simple computation that to, to prove that this is of this form. And then it's also a simple computation to prove that uh, this combination here, which is the one appearing, uh, oh, sorry, here, is given by this combination here. Where now this is the Riemann tensor of G. And we also um, verify that this solution is auto actually automatically satisfied with the assumptions that we have. So we don't have to worry about it. Okay. And we also mentioned that since alpha is parallel, it defines a co-dimension one foliation, which is going to be important in, in the following. So then, this equation is automatically satisfied because of the um, hypothesis we are making. Sorry, and I'm back. It, yeah, uh, no, I, no I guess my computer uh, dropped. So, can you say again what is alpha? I was, I yes. that. Alpha is the dual of H. So, we are in four dimensions and we are profiting from simplification that happen in four dimensions. Okay, okay. So, it's a, it's a one form. Okay. It's a one form, yeah. And so, this equation is satisfied automatically within the assumptions that we're making. So uh, we only need to consider this equation here and this equation uh, upstairs. And then we have this, this lemma. We have that this alpha defines a foliation, right? Define, its kernel defines an integrable distribution. In this foliation, all, uh, all the leaves are um, diffeomorphic to each other. Not only that, all the leaves are isometric to each other with the induced metric. And what we find is that with the, the induced metric on each of these uh, leaves needs to satisfy this equation here, which is now equation involving the square of the Ricci tensor or endomorphism, Ricci and H. And this constraint in the um, scalar curvature, okay? And what we have is the following. Since this is an algebraic equation for uh, Ricci, and all the uh, coefficients are constants because alpha is parallel, then we can solve in terms of the um, AKN values of uh, Ricci, namely its principal uh, Ricci curvatures. So what we find is that each leaf as a Riemannian three manifold has principal Ricci curvature prescribed in terms of Kappa, which is our parameter or the formation parameter, if you will, in, in as one of these three cases. So the re principal rigid curvatures need to be given by one of these three cases. And this funny relation here needs to hold. And the key point here for this nice result to come out after all these assumptions and the higher order equations is that this gives you, of course, a quadratic equation. And the point is that the discriminant of this quadratic algebraic equation is just one. We were expecting some ugly stuff, but everything conspires and cancels together, and we end up with one. And therefore, the roots of this equation can be uh, elegantly written in this in this way, which is which was surprising to us, and uh, well, it, it, it perhaps points out to to these equations making more sense than they look. So uh, after we characterize the uh, Riemannian geometry of each leaf in terms of the principal Ricci curvatures of its Ricci tensor, we can provide this uh, sort of characterization or classification uh, theorem. So a null heterotic soliton, null because we are taking the dilaton to be zero with parallel torsion because alpha is parallel, 
falls into one of these cases. Either kappa alpha square equals one, and we have this uh, principal, principal curvature as I stated before, and in which case there exists a double cover of this guy that it means I prescribe a second structure. Prescribe means that we can uh, construct it explicitly as I will uh, explain in a moment. Or then we have this uh, other relation and sorry, I think here, uh, there is what this should be one half, sorry. This should be one half. Or in this case, let me move this. So, or in this second case, the universal cover of M is isometric either to this product, R times the universal cover of SL2R or R times the universal cover of E11, which is the um, Poincare group of two-dimensional Minkowski space time, equipped with a left invariant metric with the given uh, rich curvature. Or in the third case, which is the uh, simplest one, then this is isometric to R times uh, hyperbolic space with a metric of uh, negative constant curvature. So then, uh, I don't know if I say it here. No. So then we, we can check the literature and we can verify that actually such uh, metrics do exist in these uh, Lie groups. So they do admit left invariant metrics which, uh, with this um, prescribed Ritchie curvature. So the, the um, proof, let me just give you an idea of the proof. In the first case, is to construct an endomorphism in this form using the unit norm simple eigenvector of the, our uh, Ritchie endomorphism. We decompose it on this, uh, on their symmetric and anti-symmetric um, part. And then using that, we construct this uh, Sasakian structure explicitly as stated here. And then it's a matter of uh, um, calculations and evaluations, proving that it satisfies all the required properties to be a Sasakian structure. In the second case, what we do is simply to prove the global existence of a frame, which satisfies these standard relations with CIJK constant. And then we use the uh, classification of Milnor of three-dimensional Riemannian groups to identify which groups do appear here. And the third case is, is directly. So this is a brief, very brief summary of the proof, which has uh, more steps, but just to give you a quick idea. So um, the connection with the three-dimensional solitonic system that I described as arising uh, from the heterotic Ricci flow in three dimensions is that this sigma H, which appears here as um, leaves or the typical leaf of this, for the, uh, of this co-dimension one foliation is actually an heterotic Ricci soliton. So here we are constructing uh, solutions to four dimensional supergravity as um, well through uh, four dimensional manifolds which are foliated by uh, three dimensional heterotic rich solitons. So all of these are solutions. So this shows in particular that solutions are nice and abundant, both to the heterotic rich soliton in three dimensions and to this uh, supergravity, heterotic supergravity system in four dimensions. And well, we have. Uh, some uh, simple corollaries that show uh, the explicit existence of, of solutions to these equations as characterized by the previous theorem. And I wanted to mention something that I found, I find funny, which is in, in supergravity terminology, in a sense, the flux needs to be quantized. So this alpha, it's, it's um, um, integral should be um, a natural number, let's say, intuitively speaking. What I wanted to stress, since this is constant, what I wanted to stress is that if we fix it to be a particular value, integer or semi-integer value, this one half for simplicity, then our um, string slow parameter kappa is forced to be one, two, or three, and then we have 
a sort of discrete uh, transition between the three cases. And what I find also uh, relatively interesting is that the limit kappa going to zero, which will be the generalized, which is solid on limit, is not allowed because this um, kappa appears in the denominator of various expressions. So it's not consistent. So uh, in a sense, I don't know how to properly interpret this, but in a sense, this may point to the direction that this um, contains, this heterotic uh, Ricci flow contains extra solitonic solutions, smooth and perfectly fine, which escape the um, generalized Ricci flow in the sense that they don't have even a classical limit for the heterotic Ricci flow. So I just wanted to mention that. I don't know how to interpret it. I don't know if this can be useful for applications, but that's that. So, well, these are very preliminary results that I uh, explained related to this heterotic Ricci flow and associated heterotic supergravity equations, which are a particular class of, uh, or can be understood as a particular case of these heterotic Ricci uh, solitons, at least in dimension three. So there are many, many uh, possible future directions of research. First of all, the first thing one needs to do here, I think, is to develop the proper gauge theoretic formulation of this flow and compute its solitons in every dimension. And then one needs to prove also the standard first things that one proves for this type of um, uh, curvature flows, namely if it is weakly parabolic and obtain a local existent result. Gradient formulation I write here also, but I think that's out of reach because to my biggest surprise, even the RG2 flow doesn't, is not known if it has a gradient formulation. So even if we take H equals to zero, apparently, please correct me if, if I'm wrong, the RG2 flow is not known to admit a gradient formulation, which I find very surprising. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, I'm pretty sure it's not known. Yeah. So uh, yeah, so it, this case would be even harder. So. Then one can study the moduli space a la coisho of heterotic solitons in, in on compact three or four dimensional manifolds, construct examples with half not no parallel torsion, classify left invariant solutions on simply connected Lie groups. This you can do actually, this will be interesting to do actually at the level of solitons and also at the level of uh, heterotic Ricci flows, classify those that are um, uh, left invariant on a simply connected Lie group. So you have an ODE that is, is going to be easier to handle. Another interesting thing that I would like to do also is to study this, um, even the flows also, but at least the solitons, study solutions adapted to uh, complex surfaces. So instead of considering a compact four manifold arbitrary, one consider a complex, complex surface and one takes this metric G to be a Hermitian metric in this in this complex surface. And this will be in very much relation between uh, uh, this uh, um, uh, reference that I quote here, where you classify actually, right, you know, energy solitons on uh, complex models, on complex uh, surfaces. Another thing that I'm very interested in doing as well is to study the Lorentzian analog, especially the evolution problem of the, these equations posed on a globally hyperbolic uh, Lorentzian manifold. And then um, one can also study the T-duality of heterotic solitons and perhaps even mirror symmetry because uh, Mario and his collaborators, they have found uh, the first examples of uh, heterotic mirror symmetry within non taylor uh, solutions of the Hallstrom mirror system. So, I don't know if it might be possible to extend that construction, for example, to manifolds of type S1 times S3, which are not necessarily um, quaternionic complex hop surfaces, right? Uh, I don't know uh, how much of a role in that construction it plays the fact that this hop surface is of that particular type versus being of a more general type. So I also find that uh, suggesting, so, yeah, interesting. 
So there is that. And thanks for thanks. Thanks, Carlos. Any questions? About this uh, remark towards the end that the uh, uh, that this kappa is quantized in units of uh, in units. Uh, okay, so the question is that uh, I would assume that um, that kappa is the more fundamental thing. That I mean, that kappa is the thing that you set first, and that determines uh, what the flux is, right? Like, and so uh, I think your sound is breaking. Uh, so can you? Sorry. Maybe. Yep. Maybe you can write the equation because yeah, your uh, your sound is not good, Arpan. Okay. Making you can write it in your in the chat. Okay. Yeah, the question was related to the quantization of yeah. Of I think campus. I think I understood the question. Uh, yeah, this is just some. Uh, funny remark, you don't have to take it uh, seriously, just uh, that the fact that the, in a sense, the object controlling the flux is constrained with respect to kappa to satisfy a numerical integer condition. I find it uh, interesting. Here, more interesting anyway, I think, is the fact that this doesn't admit a kappa going to zero limit. So these do not exist as solutions of the generative flow, which was to be expected, but not even a classical limit, right? That would be the classical limit. Uh -huh. um, maybe, I don't know about uh, what's more fundamental from the physical point of view. I I'm asking Arpan a uh, question on chat. Yeah. That I don't know. By the way, maybe I just make one comment about this last, yeah, this slide. Or the no, sorry, the yeah, uh, the the weak parabolicity. Uh, even just like for the regular RG two flow, you really can only prove it if you sort of also assume basically that the string parameter is is very small relative to the given curvature size, because this curvature squared term is some kind of quadratic second order term in the metric, and uh, you can't really expect it to have any kind of natural sign or anything like that. So you kind of just need an assumption, which makes it to sort of treat it as a perturbation of Ricci flow, essentially. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I already that's need, a natural yeah. assumption anyways, so. Um, yeah, you need the curvature conditions, right? At least. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah it wouldn't be general, yeah, but... Um, I think it's one of the first things one would at least like to study to see what happens in this in this context. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree it's not as well behaved in that sense as the generalized Ricci flow, indeed. So in the in the classification result that you show and uh, that you proved, uh, can you say again what are the assumptions on the so you're you are taking a yeah. three manifold? No, you are taking a four manifold, which is foliated. The, yes, I'm taking a, a four manifold with, and I assume that the dilaton is vanishing, it's constant, and the torsion is parallel. And then with the and, dual, yeah, the, the, tor no. the the foliation is determined by the kernel of the dual of the torsion. Is that exactly? Exactly. And the leaves turn out to be heterotic Ricci solitons. And did you, I guess it's not possible, yes, to confirm. Did you check that the NABLA alpha connection is non-flat, right? I guess it's not possible by the equation. Um, it's not possible because uh, alpha is nowhere vanishing. Um, yeah, no, no, yeah, but I mean by the NABLA alpha connection. I mean that it is, ah, if it is flat, the NABLA alpha connection. Yeah, I'm asking, yeah. I thought about this at some point. Uh, let me go back. Ah, yes. Um, this is this is the uh, curvature, curvature tensor of Nabla Alpha, and this is in general non-vanishing indeed. Okay. Yeah. I, I imagine because of the classification result does not allow. Yeah. If you were flat, you would have another geometry. Yeah. 
in fact, it doesn't allow because of this equation. Sorry. It, it, ex, it states that the norm of this, uh, of the curvature of the NABLA H connection, let's say, is equal to the pointwise to the norm of alpha, which is nowhere vanishing. So it is not allowed indeed, as you say. Um, yeah. And can, can, you, can you go back to this evolution equation for, for the dilaton? And can you say a reference for this? Uh, yes. Well, um, let me locate that. Where was this? Here. So these are the references that I can I can um, write them perhaps uh, in a moment. But they are they are for the higher order corrections. But for the lower for the first order uh, case, I would recommend just uh, to check this um, gradient flow for the worksheet nonlinear sigma models of Olinik, Suneta, and Volga. There, you can see that um, in equation 2.6, 2.7, and 2.8, they have exactly uh, these equations that I wrote here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but there are other references where this appears because I was worried I was making a mistake here. So I check this in, in other references, but um, I, I can think about it and, and sure. send it. but um, yeah. But a priori seems to be consistent, right? That this is the right lap, uh, heat equation, so to say, but then in the gradient formulation of the generalized Ricci flow, a different um, evolution equation, which is backwards needs to be considered. That's consistent, right? I mean, yeah, so the, I guess I, I was surprised because I I knew this from the paper by Callan, Martinek, Perry. Yeah, and they they write a different beta function for the dilaton. What confused me most with this is the fact that people use as beta functionals defined in this renormalization group flow proper beta functionals and anomaly vial coefficients, which are a modification. And um, I don't know the source of the differences there, but for example, try check uh, Pol Polchinski. Try check the first volume of Polchinski, which is one of the standard reference for these things. And I think he also writes the um, RG flow in this, in this form. Okay, so if there are no further comments or questions, let's thank Carlos again for the nice talk. Thanks. And uh, yeah, I'm not sure, Jeff, are we meeting next week or are we stopping for the Christ for the East break? Or? Uh, no, yeah, um, uh, it's supposed to be uh, Anna next week. Okay. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah, it should, it should be Anna next week, and then that might be the last week, or um, it's possible Marco's students will speak after that. Um, he had mentioned they they might want to speak near the end, but uh, we'll see. We'll see. Yeah, this, I was trying to the, the seminar. I'm sorry, hey Jeff. Can you stop the recording, maybe? Because I think since my computer dropped, I think it's now yeah. you the host. Or... Yeah.